Stephen, why don't we start by, <clears throat> I'd just like to get your sense of this conference, the Spirit of Humanity Forum. You came a long way from Australia to be with us today. Yeah. What did you take away from the conference, the meaning of the conference? Yeah. Well, this is the second one I've been to, actually, and I think the thing which I always find here is the intelligence. The number, the speakers they have from a variety of different backgrounds, but they're all exceptionally and excel in whatever sphere they're in. Mm -hmm. But the common thing and thread which they all have is a spiritual dimension, which they then share through the experiences of the work they do and their inner dimension mm -hmm. on life. Now you have a, a, a very vast <laughs> career background and you've done a lot of different things. Uh, you run technology companies, venture capital firms, mm -hmm. you've been involved in peace movements. Uh, what do you hope to take away from this and bring into your life? Bring in, you talked about meditation and, and how do you bring this into the, the companies that you work with, the people that you meet? So I think really sort of for me, uh, uh, the spiritual dimension comes through in the activities which I do. I don't really think about it on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis or how do I actually bring it in. But I think we all, at the end of the day, are, are spiritual beings. And that dimension gets reflected in the way we operate and work. So for me, like let's say the thing I put a lot of time in to be the Institute for Economics and Peace. But it's a hard-headed research think tank. Mm -hmm. What it focuses on is developing metrics to measure peace. Mm -hmm. And that has appeal to both the left and the right and to those which are spiritually mm -hmm. orientated and those which aren't. This index, uh, where are we on the index today in terms of peace? Well, we've been doing it for about a decade now and what we've found over that period of time, and this is contrary to mm -hmm. what most people think, the state of global peaceness peacefulness has only slightly come off. 86 countries have decreased, mm -hmm. but 76 countries have actually increased. In terms of peacefulness? Yeah, in terms of peacefulness. So you've got this duality going on, and you've got this growing mm -hmm. global mm -hmm. inequality and peace. The most peaceful nations are probably the most peaceful they've ever been in their history. Mm -hmm. So we can go into them, we can see the homicide rates are lower now, than they were 50 years or 100 years ago. Percentage of GDP spent on the militaries, 30 to 40% of what it was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But you go to the other end, the most stressed out countries in the world, your Syrias, your Iraqs, mm -hmm. your Afghanistans, and they're progressively becoming less peaceful. Mm -hmm. So at one end, we've got part of the world becoming highly more peaceful, at the other end, less peaceful. And if you actually took the middle, and this is quite fascinating, mm -hmm. if you took the Middle East out of the world, in the last decade, the world would have actually become more peaceful. I see. Do you see a way as a human race that we can become more peaceful? Is there, is there kind of a scenario that you see unfolding? Uh, do, we, do, we, do we need a cataclysm like, like climate change that causes uh, mass dislocation of people for nations to come together to somehow figure out some of the problems that we face. Uh, how do we go about, we, we, the League of Nations failed, the United Nations has not been such a successful operation. Yeah, I have to agree. Yeah. So is there a scenario that you see out there? I think when we look at it, we've got a world which in many ways is rallying around a lot of the uh, challenges of our age, climate change, ever decreasing biodiversity, full use of fresh water on the planet. And all of these, and these are just naming some, mm -hmm. are global in nature. And unless we have a world which is basically peaceful, we'll never get the levels of trust, mm -hmm. cooperation or inclusiveness necessary to solve these problems. So in my view, peace is a prerequisite for society existing as we know it in the 21st century. Now we come back to it, peace is achievable and it's quite practical. And so the research we're doing in this, in, is around what actually creates peaceful societies. And they're societies which are resilient, so they don't actually fall into a conflict. And when they do get challenged, with let's say climate change events and others, they're likely to be much more adaptable. Mm -hmm. And that is called positive peace. Mm -hmm. So they're the attitudes, institutions and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. But I think 
What's profound in it, it operates as a system. Most politicians, and the way we think about solving problems today, we think about it from a causal relationship. Okay, there's a problem, what's the cause, let's fix it. Mm -hmm. But societies, like me and you, we're systems. Mm -hmm. And by taking a systems approach, this gets really complex, I mm -hmm. can't get into it now, mm -hmm. but by taking a systems approach, and then using positive peace as the direction where you want to take the society, peace is achievable, practical, and can be done. What about the competition that we see in the world today, especially among the great powers, China, Russia, America, the EU, uh, everyone seems to be trying to carve out a larger piece of the turf, trying to become more powerful. Uh, it, we seem to be going back into a Cold War state between Russia and the United States and China kind of playing the cards, you know, should I go with Russia, should I go with America, what should I do here? Where do you see this evolving? You can see it coming from Australia, you can see this really played out in Australia. So the country we're closest to, culturally, and the one we've got our defence ties China. with, is, is, no, the US. But our biggest trading partner is China. And so you can see these dynamics getting played out there. But I think where we are at the moment, we're in a phase transition because these global issues are going to come on us. And let's face it, competition's never going to disappear. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of advantages which do come out of competition. Mm -hmm. If we look at the competition of companies and the way that actually thrives and creates innovation, and the competition of nations is providing it's not done on the battlefield, it's probably not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But do you see these these populist movements, the, the, these strong leaders that have emerged, President Xi in yeah. China, Putin in Russia, Trump in America, uh, they, they, they seem to be vying for power, you know, vying for more influence, rather than coming together to solve some of these monumental problems that we face today. How do we get around that? How do we get these people to come together, sit down like they did in, in World War II and say, we have a common foe. At the time it was Hitler, but now mm -hmm. it's climate change. Now it's lack of water. Now it's filthy air. How do we get these leaders to say, we need to change this and we need to find a way to change the economic paradigm so that we can all share in prosperity? I think the change needs to come from within, within a lot of these countries. And it comes about because we live in an age which is now interconnected, particularly through the internet and through social media. And I think as people now start to get more and more disillusioned with the systems, we can see it in the West, we can see it in the rise of popularism. Mm -hmm. We've got a change going on. We're just in the first part and phases of those change. China has been on an economic miracle now for going on 30 years, but that miracle won't last. Mm -hmm. And that change will create change. Mm -hmm. Putin in Russia is much, much weakened than what it was, let's say, even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. If we look in the last two years, Putin's actually cut back on military expenditure. It's the oil revenues which Russia have got dry up, as we're getting more as the prices are dropping, and as particularly as we start to get the change to other forms of technology, that'll undermine a lot of the economies there, and that'll, again, come back and create change. So if we look at populism, mm -hmm. and I'll bring it back to positive peace. Mm -hmm. So now, the good news is that 75% of the countries in the world in the last 20 years have increased in positive peace, mm -hmm. but the country which has had the third largest drop in the positive piece, is the United States. Mm -hmm. If we came to Europe and we looked at the European countries, 17 of the 32 European countries have actually had declines in positive piece as mm -hmm. well. Not as great as the US, mm -hmm. but this is all signs of change. And what populism is, it's a backlash to the leaders of society not being able to give the average citizen what they want. The elites are different. The mm -hmm. elites are doing well. People like me, we're mm -hmm. doing well. Mm -hmm. So now, the populist movements today, both of the far left and the far right, aren't actually really addressing their, the underlying issues with working class and the lower class people within society. Mm -hmm. But those movements will arrive. 
this movement for or against peace in these in these various nations. Mm -hmm. So this what, is, this, what, what yeah. precipitates mm -hmm. a movement towards peace mm -hmm. and a movement against, away from mm -hmm. peace? So what I'd argue and argue strongly, and this is contrary to the narrative, because the narrative, and particularly through the media, focuses on the negative. Okay, and because we all know that feels to emotions which cause people to watch a news story, buy a newspaper and mm -hmm. such. But the world actually, if we just took the Middle East out of it in the last decade, has become more peaceful. And one of the areas which has been driven on by that uh, yeah, improvement, and this comes as a shock to most people, mm -hmm. is militarisation. So if we look at militarisation and we look at the, the number of actual weapons, which mm -hmm. most of the big countries have got, they're actually been decreasing. They are becoming more sophisticated, so each weapon's costing a lot more. But if you look at the percentage of GDP spent on the military, far more countries have decreased than increased. Mm -hmm. Most people don't actually realise mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So last year, uh, well, in the last 12 months, 2016, the world actually became slightly more peaceful. <laughs> More countries improved. So when we're looking at peace, quite often people just focus on the geopolitical situation. But mm. peace is much more than that. It's mm. the levels of militarisation. It's the levels of conflict within society and also domestic social safety and security mm. issues. Mm -hmm. So one of the measures which has been proving dramatically in the last decade is the concept of state-sponsored state terror. Mm. So state-sponsored terror is the state doing extrajudicial killings, torture, imprisonment without trial. So over the last decade, that's improved remarkably. So we're seeing a lot more countries actually becoming more civilised. And some of them may be ruled by strong men, mm -hmm. but the underlying movement is not all negative. Do you, the Spirit of Humanity Forum, it, how does this impact? Uh, it's a small group of people maybe 200 yeah. people. Can it have an impact on creating peace? Well, I think it can have some impact on creating peace. And I think there's a lot of things which need to come together to get a peaceful world. But a lot of the time when people are thinking of peace, they're thinking of extremes, okay? They think of a world which is totally peaceful, where no one actually has, yeah, there's no violence, mm -hmm. or a world which is in conflict. And that's not the way it is. So the world is both peaceful and unpeaceful, as yet the audience can see in their own lives. Mm -hmm. They have aspects of their lives which are really quite peaceful and other things, other areas which cause conflict. Mm -hmm. So the th issue is the progression, where are we moving? So if we look back over the history of humanity, we went back to prehistoric ages, mm -hmm. probably about 30% of people died violently. Well, what I want you to do is think about slavery. We'd been living in the 16th, the 17th century in the United States. In many parts of the world would be very acceptable, including England. Mm -hmm. Think about the Middle Ages. We wouldn't put someone's head on a stake now after we cut it off, mm -hmm. would we? Mm -hmm. So there's this slow progression through history of the world becoming more civilised and becoming more peaceful. And this is associated with the progression of society. We can see in all sorts of ways society's better now than what it was 100 year, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 1,000 years ago. But, so yeah. when we're looking at today, so the issues of today, yeah. they're there, and we need to work at them, and we need to solve them. But we are in a progress moving forward. But slavery is coming back in many forms all across the world. Uh, we see countries arming themselves. We see countries actually disintegrating countries like Syria, countries like Iraq, countries like Afghanistan, countries in Africa. And terrorism's on the rise. We've got more battlefield deaths now than we've had in the last 20 years. This is true. So what we're doing is just focusing on some of the negatives. Mm -hmm. But overall homicide rates are decreasing. Mm -hmm. So is violent crime globally. Mm -hmm. There are other forms of violence. So if we look at, let's say, terrorism, for example, 18,000 people died, sorry, 28,000 people died in 2015 through terrorism. Mm -hmm. In that same year, 436,000 people died 
with homicides. Mm -hmm. One million people mm -hmm. committed suicide. So quite often we focus in on the things which are most alarming to us. They're dramatic. And, and dramatic without actually looking at everything. Mm -hmm. So if you like, we can have a narrative. Mm -hmm. And a narrative is where we take something and we explore it, explain it, and have a rationality around it. But the problem with a narrative, it's one story. Mm -hmm. And so to really understand something, you need a picture. And each narrative or story is only one pixel on that picture. Mm -hmm. And that is the beauty of an index, like the Global Peace Index. It gives you the whole picture, and then you've got the ability to flow down in different nuances. So everything you're saying is true, but there are other counteracting things happening as well. And you sound optimistic and hopeful. Somewhat optimistic and hopeful. I think we've got the, we live in an age with serious challenges. We're definitely overpopulated. Mm -hmm. We're consuming the bioresources of the planet faster than we're replenishing them. And these, these are really serious things. Mm -hmm. Climate change will probably beat it because of the advances in battery technology and other forms of energy. Mm -hmm. But we do have really serious uh, problems coming up. So I'm neither optimistic or pessimistic. I just want to be progressive. Uh, can you imagine, though, if we as a global community were able to work together rather than pushing each other away? If we, our president wants to spend $59 billion more on defense, mm. the Chinese are building up their defense, Russia's talking about building up mm. their defense mechanisms. If all of those resources were going towards reforestation, uh, you know, stopping the pollution in places like Delhi. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. If we looked at the cost of violence to the global economy in 2016, it came in at $13.6 trillion. Mm. Okay, just to, just to put that in perspective, mm. that's 10 times all the foreign direct investment which occurred in that year. So small reductions in violence, because the money spent on, let's say, presence, on protecting yourself against thieves, or on armies and military hardware where we're worried about the uh, uh, yeah, aggressive uh, yeah, nations. Mm. If we could direct part of that into these things, we'd have enough money to solve the problems of our age. Now, things like the spirit of humanity, just the name itself, it's a holistic name, takes in concept of the globe. Now, it's one organisation, and it's quite rightly point out, just a few hundred people. But if you've got many, many groups like this, and they are around, they're all doing their bit. And I do believe that there's a change in consciousness going on. I give a lot of talks in many different places mm -hmm. around the world, and the youth particularly get it. People my age, well... I won't be around long enough to really get the effects of what I'm doing, but the youth can see it. The youth can see it, and, they're, and their voices are growing, and as they get older, they will become the leaders. So they become the leaders. They'll be brought up in a psychology and a mentality to think globally and think about the interconnected nature of other systems like the biosphere.